So welcome everybody to another uh, Lean Portland first Tuesday happy hour. And I'm really excited to introduce um, my friend, Stephanie. She, I, I've met Stephanie through the Women in Lean group. And Stephanie, I'm going to let you um, introduce yourself in a moment. Uh, you've been doing Lean and Six Sigma work for a, a while now, has your own consulting firm called Lightbulb Moments. And um, I saw this presentation that you gave at, I think, a Women in Lean interchange yep. mm -hmm. several months back. And I thought this was so cool how you took these tools um, and really they are simple tools, but we're able to apply them to a business that we aren't always working in. So um, with that, I will hand it over to you. All right. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so... First thing I want to say is uh, may the fourth be with you. I have to start it that way. It's very important. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Stephanie Hill, Lightbulb Moment Consulting. Um, I've been in continuous improvement for 20 years now, and about half of that has been in manufacturing, and half of that has been in more transactional environments. Um, so, you know, health, health insurance, um, you know, healthcare environment, little retail, um, working with, uh, you know, the housing, uh, like housing development, new building, that kind of uh, exposure. So um, I really like the variety of continuous improvement, how it can be applied. So um, yeah, this, this opportunity that I had, and I want to share with you today, um, I just think it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just a lot of fun for me to share. So um, just logistically, if you would hold your questions till the end, um, if you have a burning question in mind and you wanna put it in the chat, um, our wonderful Maria has offered to uh, facilitate Q&A for us at the end of it. So you can go ahead and do that and I'll just address it at the end. All right, so I'm gonna get into it. Um, prism body piercing. So, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of the backstory before we get too far into it. Um, I, if for those of you who were on early in the call, I introduced Rob Hill, so he is on right now. Um, he is the owner and piercer for Prism Body Piercing. Um, he's also my significant other, so the last name sound familiar, you know, that could be part of it. Um, I, so I met Rob in 2011, and before we started dating, this uh, Canadian was really kind of like a nomad. So he was really well known in the piercing industry. Um, he spent most of his time traveling. Uh, so he was, he was sort of sought after as this body piercer and he would do guest spots and get paid to just visit different people's shops around um, the US and Canada. And so like this, these are some examples of, you know, jewelry, jewelry, uh, ear projects that he's done. Um, he's, won, he's won awards. And he is a speaker at the Association of Professional Piercers, um, which is an international conference every year. So, you know, this was kind of like Rob's, Rob's vibe. And he was, when I met him, he was sort of temporarily in Iowa, um, stationed in the back of a tattoo shop. And he wasn't really getting the clientele that he was hoping for. Um, his, you know, they were essentially like maybe tattoo clients that had piercing as an afterthought and just kind of swung by his counter to ask what he had. Um, so they weren't necessarily seeking him out. They didn't necessarily know him. So I had a friend of mine um, who wanted to get pierced do like a little mystery shopping for me. She went in there and she loved her piercing, loved the experience, um, but she said it was a little bit like getting pierced out of a teenager's basement. That was the phrase that she used. Uh, so I shared that with Rob and, you know, he, he decided that, you know, as we got closer, he wanted to just put down roots here in Iowa. So he was going to need to make some changes. Um, he decided to do a, you know, to invest in a remodel for the shop and kind of a rebranding. And knowing that I worked in continuous improvement, um, he was open to getting some help with that. So the first thing that I suggested was that we look at the alignment or misalignment of values. 
um, what he considered really important versus what his clientele or potential clientele, um, people pretty much who came through the tattoo shop were looking for. And so you can see from here um, that there was a significant mismatch between the two. So we, we just really, like Maria said that this was simple stuff. We actually had just half sheets of paper where we had people who walked in, we just handed them a piece, piece of paper, whether they were getting you know, piercing or a tattoo or whatever. And um, they would rank things in order of what they thought was important. So as you can see here, the biggest thing for them was that it was cheap. Okay, so if you look in the previous, if you think about the previous slide and the fact that Rob was really into using gold and genuine diamonds and genuine gemstones, um, cheap and that don't really go hand in hand. Um, and then they wanted a big selection uh, from, you know, they wanted to hear from their friends that they liked the place. And so Rob, on the other hand, was really looking about the, the cleanliness, the safety. Um, he wanted a good referral. He wanted that because people felt comfortable at his shop and felt like they were gonna get the best that they could. So there was just some misalignment here. Um, he was, so his, his investment was around like sterilization equipment and getting really high end sterilization equipment, um, implant grade jewelry, and then reinvesting every year in his recertification for the Association of Professional Piercers, which is a really um, difficult uh, certification to get. And even here in Des Moines, I think there's only two shops that have that. Um, and here in Des Moines also, we don't have any body piercing regulations. Um, I know you do in Oregon, but that was, another, that was another thing that people weren't aware of. And so they just assumed everybody was you know, safe to work with and that wasn't the, that wasn't the case. All right, so seeing this mismatch, um, he realized he was gonna have to attract new clients or have clients that had a different mindset or he was gonna have to change what he was doing. And he was not willing to sacrifice safety um, to match the clients that were walking in the door. So we, we focused first on, you know, looking at continuous improvement as ways to um, not just reduce waste. Like I think that that's a common thing you hear with lean is reducing waste, um, but really looking at using our like efficiency and effectiveness in order to change customers' perception of the business and, and increase the reputation. <laughs> So the first thing that we did was looked at the time he was spending um, with the shop. So because it's actually in a mall, um, he had you know set hours that he was working and he would be there typically from like 10 a.m. till 9 p.m., six days a week. And he was piercing the entire time or you know being in the shop in some way that whole time. So I did um, time studies with him and kind of broke down the, the key activities that he was doing. And so um, he didn't think that he could afford to hire anybody because of the amount of income and how many you know, people he could pierce and all that. And so um, we laid that out and it was about around 25 minutes that it would take from end to end with a customer. In the scenario that I uh, wrote out for him for the second one was if he had a counter staff, a counter person to help him out um, and they would be you know, fairly inexpensive to have. That green line represents a single client. So they would come in and get the first part of it, you know, handled with a, the counter person. They would go back to the piercing room, the second part of it, and then go back to the counter for kind of the closeout piece. If he did that, he, it would take about 20 minutes for that one client, which is a reduction in time. However, the key thing is that he could do, have two clients working in parallel. So when he had, you know, somebody in the back room, somebody else could be at the front counter getting staged to go to the back room for a piercing. That amount of time would take about 25 and a half minutes total. So in almost the same amount of time, he could have two clients versus one. So with that kind of a change and actually hiring somebody, it would be less expensive. So thinking of himself as the owner and piercer, it's, a, it's essentially a higher, much higher paid position. Um, so he could pay less essentially from the business and be able to have more from a client standpoint. So that gave him the chance to start working on the business versus just working in the business. Um, and then the next thing that we did was to lay out um, a map. So standardizing the process, looking at what happens from the time the customer comes in, the counter help, their role, and then the piercer's role. 
And so um, before we even had somebody walk in the door as a person to help with the counter, uh, we laid out all of the process steps. And so we converted that, um, there's, there's a pretty slick way you can take, I don't know, y'all are doing process mapping, but that you could take a Visio map and you can convert it into a Word document, which you see on the left. So if somebody who walks in the door has never seen a map before, um, they can easily probably follow a Word document that gives them step-by-step -step instructions of what to do. All right, so that helped for onboarding um, as well as just ensuring that there was a consistent experience from clients that would walk in the door. And Rob went from being just himself to having um, a person to work counter and then he ended up hiring two piercers um, later down the road. All right, so <clears throat> a lot of this was me kind of teaching the tool. So kind of like you guys were doing with the, I don't remember what was it called, fruit tree or Portland fruit tree project. Um, so like teaching the, the lean tools and then Rob would run with it. So he, he just loves, the, I, I don't know, I don't wanna speak for Rob, but it seems like he just loves this stuff. Um, so this, this piece of visual management was something that um, he did totally on his own. Um, and I don't know, I think one of his, uh, one of the counter people actually helped him with this as well. Um, but this is a bunch of little drawings that represent a display case of gold and genuine um, gems that he has. So this is the actual display. And he has a photo album full of these little display images. And so it does, you know, a few things. So um, one of the things is it has pricing so they can kind of easily match that up with what's in the display. Um, but it also has, you know, he can tell if anything is missing from the display in a fairly simple way. Uh, and the other thing is that he, when they sell a piece of jewelry, they peel off that sticky note and they put it onto a different page that says order more. So it's a really easy way, whether it's Rob or somebody else who's gonna be making a jewelry order, um, they can see what's, what's missing, what they need to be ordering from that case. So it's like a cool, I don't know, visual management that they put in place. Okay, so this is um, the tray layout that Rob uses. Um, so, you know, he does, he, he works with aseptic techniques. So, you know, the cleanest to dirtiest, so sterile to least sterile, or dirtiest, I guess, I don't know if I'm using the right words, he's, he's better with that stuff. Um, but I think about piercing as like a, a small surgery, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so if you picture being in a surg surgical environment, right? So you're a patient lying on a bed, on a sur surgery bed or whatever, and your surgeon gets to you and says, okay, where is the gauze? Does any, could somebody, where's the gauze? You know, like that, that would not be good, right? And so it's not quite that severe, but at the same time, you know, he might have a, piercing needle in one hand and maybe he's working with the client with the needle at that time and he has to be able to reach over and not really take his eyes off of the client and know exactly where on the tray the materials he needs would be located. So having a constant and common setup for himself and everybody else in the studio ensures that no matter what they do they know exactly where to reach and they know exactly what how the setup is going to be. Um, Kanban cards. So um, I, again, I explained the concept of the Kanban cards. Rob was the one who figured out the reorder points for his different items that he has in the shop. And then he even had color-coded um, Kanban cards so that they indicated where their, um, oh my gosh, the word's escaping me right now. Their like fulfillment was gonna be located. So, you know, if it had some, if there was going to be, you know, additional back stock, maybe it would indicate that. If it was something they had to order online, whatever the case is, they were color coded according to where they were from and what the next steps were. And so this, again, was something that anybody in the shop could, could manage on their own. And so Rob would come in and there would be a stack for him to grab and maybe he would go make a new order for that inventory. All right. Okay, so... You can't talk, well, for us anyway, can't talk about customer perception um, and safety without talking about the spaghetti diagrams that we worked on. Okay, so this was the original layout of the shop in 2011. Okay, so, and you can see my mouse, right? I think. Yep, we can see it, Stephanie. Yep. 
Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so this, you know, there's some stuff that's not shown here in the picture, but there's a front entry kind of here for the shop. Um, and so Rob would be standing on this side of the counter and, you know, somebody would come around. So they're they gonna get pierced. So they would come around, Rob would greet them. They would walk through here. So this front room is a tattoo room. So he could have, there could be an artist in here working on somebody else and they push the curtain out of the way, walk past these people, push another curtain out of the way, walk to the back room here. Rob does a quick consultation with them, make sure everything, they you know what they're doing, all that. He excuses himself and he walks past through here again, past two other tattoo rooms down here where the sterilization room is. He goes in, he starts the sterilization process, which I think is about six minutes or so. So in the meantime, he goes back because he doesn't want to make his client feel uncomfortable, chit chats for a little bit. Okay, it's about time to go back and get the sterilization, sterilized equipment. So he goes back to the sterilization room, gets the materials. Now at this time, he's walking back through here and he's carrying a tray of things that he does not want to drop because he's just sterilized them. So jewelry, um, you know, he might have sharps on the, on the tray and all that. So in the meantime, you know, you have people who are in this front lobby area who can see him walking back and forth randomly and carrying stuff that's gonna go all the way back here. But also you have the potential to collide with people coming out of tattoo rooms and in this room here where he's gotta push curtains on the way while holding a tray of materials for the client. So all of that was 249 feet. All right, so then we did the remodel. And so everything, again, it was set up with an aseptic layout, um, but everything was essentially in a single room. So there's a lot of movement because he's you know, disposing of things and going back and forth within here. Honestly, like this probably, the first one doesn't really represent all of his movement because it only showed him going into the room. It didn't really show the activity within the room, but still, this is what he was doing here. Um, and so everything, you know, we only really witnessed by that particular client. Um, everything is a lot more, you know, a lot closer to him. He doesn't run the risk of dropping things that are sharks, um, not nearly as much. And so when that was the setup, the spaghetti diagram was 120 feet. So that was more than half of what it was or less than half of what it was from the first time that he did that. Um, and so I mentioned that Rob like would take all this stuff and run with it. And so I literally like I drew this diagram and I showed it to him. And then I went to the front lobby and then he went back there. I think he had a client or something. And he was there a little longer, you know, after the client walked out. And then he came back and he was like, okay, check it out now. <laughs> so he had taken this, this uh, massage chair, piercing chair, whatever. And he had moved it so it was parallel to this counter here. And so then I don't, I don't have the skills to do a spaghetti diagram for that because it was literally pivots. So he would see the person, throw something, see the person do that. Like he just, it was all pivoting and he took out so much motion just from the way he changed it. So that was really cool. Um, and so just kind of after all of these changes and um, just getting really crisp, efficient, effective, um, and ensuring that everything just kind of came across as streamlined and professional with clients. We did another survey with the client set in 2014. So if you remember, you know, the low price was number one, so that got a 10. In 2014, we did another survey and the clients picked cleanliness and sterility as their top thing they valued with their piercing, um, followed by the customer service and the reputation of the piercers. So that was, that was a big deal. Um, the question is, would a client pay more for those kinds of things, right? So it's not enough for them to like it and think it's a good thing, but are they willing to spend money and help Rob's shop grow? So this graph demonstrates the revenue um, year over year uh, for how the shop did in terms of sales. He asked, Rob asked that I don't share the actual dollar figures. Um, so I just removed the Y axis essentially, but it just continues to grow and grow. Um, so we took out just full disclosure, we took out 2020 because his shop was closed for a good chunk of the year, 
because of COVID. Um, so I, the sales would have dropped a little bit for 2020, but otherwise it was going up. All right. And so this is our contact information. And I also included the website for safepiercing.org. Um, so if you wanted to learn more about safe body piercing or to find a piercer in your area, um, you can look here or, or ask us. We know people there too. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up a few points and circle back to them. So first of all, ensure that where you focus your energy is in alignment with what your customer values. Um, if, if they're not aligned, there's going to be some waste, right? Or, or there's just going to be, you know, money spent that's not going to be for any good reason or, you know, like whatever. So just really important to align with your customer. Um, the second thing is that sometimes it can be more cost effective to hire someone. And I mean that both in the work setting as well as in the home setting. Um, I, I think we always assume we have to do it all. And you really can't work on your process if you're always working in your process. So that's even in the home setting. So it's hard to work on yourself when you're always just in the middle of the hustle and bustle. Um, and so Rob was feeling that and I think it was it alleviated a lot and gave him the freedom to be innovative and to focus on the future versus the right now. Um, so that was really big. And then the third one is that we often talk about lean as you know, around waste removal and then cost reduction. I know a lot of companies focus on, you know, how much money is it gonna save? But if you're really being efficient and effective in serving your customer, then your results can have a significant impact on uh, revenue, growth, and customer retention. And just so you know too, um, Rob is celebrating the fact that he's gonna be opening a brand new piercing shop um, in July. So his first, his first thing he said he was looking at was the flow. And so that was kind of how he laid out the whole design of the shop. So it's pretty proud of that. All right, I am totally ready for Q&A. Thank you, Stephanie, that was great. And I love um, the points you were making on, on the end, especially you know about that piece on value. Amanda, you were talking about that too with the um, fruit tree project. Uh, in terms of understanding, you know, it's more than just eliminating waste, which I think we over-focused on in some of the early years of lean. And, you know, there's so much more that we can achieve, kind of expand what we're looking on, looking at. Yeah, definitely. And thanks, Trish. I saw your little applause. That was sweet. <laughs> Welcome. I'm still driving. Sorry, everybody. But that was really great. Um, sorry, I'm just going to jump in. But I've known, uh, well, I obviously know Stephanie my whole life, but she's my sister. <laughs> but um, I knew about her and Rob and working on the shop, but I had no idea the amount of work you all put into really thinking about the process and mm -hmm. um, how it works. It's super impressive. So nice job, both of you. Thank you. I had a question, but it it's less about the shop and more about one of the things that you, you threw in there. You said that you took uh, the Visio and you automatically made the Visio go into Word. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, have to learn it, that skill. And it's not like, if, any, <laughs> if anybody else, oh, Dustin apparently wants to, <laughs> um, wants to know too. And I, I shouldn't say the word automatically, that makes it sound a little more magical than it, than it is, because it, you have to kind of know what you're doing, um, but it's, yeah. So you have to like, you num you do an auto numbering of the shapes and then you have to convert okay. it to Excel and then you can copy it over. Okay. So like okay. Excel is the middleman, but. That sounds like something fun to play with. So thank yeah. you for bringing that into our, our lives. Yeah. Send me a message and I'll go over that with you. Awesome. You too, Dustin. I don't think we're friends on LinkedIn, but you're welcome to reach out to me. <laughs> Yes, we also share sweet tips and tricks here. So thank you for that. Auto number the shapes, convert to Excel, and then put it in Word. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. And I'd just like to say that, you know, I really love the presentation. I love how you shared with us the actual activities that you did so that we mm -hmm. could really see um, those changes and how dramatic they were. So really great job. Yeah. And I, and I, 
you know, Rob and I talk about this too, but like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like everything that changed in his life had to do with lean. <laughs> um, but I will say that I believe the fact that he learned that he could step back and have some space and then to also have some excess <laughs> to be able to reinvest. So he needed to be able to generate money and to save money in order to reinvest in high-end jewelry, you know, getting things that are going to attract clients and to get more, um, more promotion out there and to the community. So. Stephanie, how did you select uh, the categories for the survey with the customer? Um, oh, that was a long time ago. I don't really remember. <laughs> Rob, are you still listening? He might have. He might be working it. Do you remember how yeah. we chose the categories, Rob, for the customer or for what? Um, we were talking about the uh, the things that I valued the most uh, in what I want to present to the client. Mm -hmm. And then we asked what the client found, uh, what we thought the client was most interested in or how that compared or how those two compared. I think that's what we did was just what I thought was a, a big value to the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if there was ever like an open-ended, just kind of like, I wouldn't say focus group, but you know, like asking a few people that came in, just what, what we were missing, you know, like, um, I honestly just can't remember. I remember the half sheets of paper very clearly though. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> did you all do us like a, like a sir? Like, did you like have a handful of people come through and like, Hey, can you give us feedback? And then they gave you that on some formal way, or was it just like an informal thing? Do you remember how you all did that? It was like people walking into the, into the, so, um, the tattoo shop is called color work. So, you know, people coming into the shop, whether it was for color works or for, you know, prism and they had a shared countertop in 2011. And so we just had them right next to the register. And so as people were, were leaving, we'd say like, Hey, before you head out, could you just fill this out for us? And th that was who it was. And I have a, another question if we, if that's all right. Um, so what about some of the resistance? Did you find that like, once you saw the results and maybe this is more, I think it's Rob for him. Um, but like, once you saw the results, was there any resistance to making those changes? Uh, we, <clears throat> we still get resistance. So yeah, not Sorry, we've realized from the clients, right? Is that what you were saying, Amanda? Um, I, I meant more from the staff, from maybe Rob himself, of, of looking at that and saying, oh, I like it this way, and I like the curtains, or whatever it was, or the counter is fine, and it doesn't need to be changed. Um, but the customers, it would be interesting to hear about that challenge as well, because that can be quite challenging. Yeah. Go ahead, Rob. I didn't mean to. I just wanted to clarify that before. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, change is always difficult. Um, but for, uh, I knew that finding a better way to do things is going to be in my advantage long-term, you know, and, and I was able to see that early. Uh, so yeah, having an open mind to it was, was, you know, I mean, at first I was just like, this is a lot of, you know, technical mumbo jumbo that I don't get. <laughs> and, uh then it was, uh, you know, it started to become very clear very quickly. And then that's when I was sold and just jumped all in with it. Um, and even still designing the new studio now, you know, we're applying a lot of the same kind of concepts. Um, we've honed in over the years to kind of figure things out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a little, 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 you know, it was new and hard to get used to at first, but it became very easy. Uh, from the customer's perspective, um, you know, clients making that change into our new processes and uh, and we've realized over time that not every person that walks in the door is our client and that's okay. Um, so they naturally kind of filter themselves out when they kind of see what we present and uh, see the price that we attach to it. So once they can see the uh, what they get for what they pay, they may decide that it's not for them. 
Um, but that's okay. It makes room for, uh, for others. Yeah. And that, that's a common thing that I, I would say both Rob and I have heard at the Association of Professional Piercers Conference, because there are a lot of like newer piercers or piercers that are changing from what they used to do to what they want to do. And they're always saying, but I, but I get so much pushback that it's too much money or, you know, they're not going to spend that or how dare we try to charge that, you know, those kinds of things. And mm. um, I, I think I would say probably all of them have gone through that evolution and that statement that Rob just made that not everyone is our customer is a very important discovery and acceptance point to make that shift. <laughs> Patty, Patty, you should share that one with other people. Sorry, my dog's barking. <laughs> I said, Rob is cute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, I thought I was going to say so. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention. Oh my gosh, Tippy, She's 16 and she, she can't see very well. So every single sound she freaks out about. So I apologize. Um, you probably can't even hear her. Uh, but anyway, so when Rob and I first met, um, he told me he worked. So this isn't well, I guess it's kind of lean, but he told me he was in body piercing. And I was like, oh, I just, I just standardized the processes for uh, piercing shops and, you know, talking about their regulations and all that. And he was like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, I did. It's like, no, you didn't. I did because I have my master's in public health and my, oh. <laughs> my final project that I did was it was published and it was standardizing environmental health practices in Iowa. And so part of it was like mapping out the processes for inspections and for, you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. And so, so I happened to have like my file right next to where we were. And I'm like, let me show you, I can prove it. And so I pull out my map that I had done and he goes, look at the title. And it said uh, tattoo studio process. So the tattoo shops in Iowa are regulated, but not the piercing mm -hmm. shops. Mm -hmm. And so um, he and I started this huge like endeavor of um, lobbying, essentially, <laughs> like, like we had was like something like 20 different shops, um, you know, signing this petition, we were meeting regularly with other shops. Um, I had the Iowa Public Health Association working with us. And we had like a politician who had like helped us draft a bill to take mm -hmm. it, it failed miserably, unfortunately, despite the work. <laughs> But it kind of went hand in hand with like what we were trying to do with the shop and standardizing practices and regulating and all that. And so that was the failure that uh, we didn't share in the presentation. <laughs> well, there's a lot of um, a lot of this thinking and, and process checking that I think can be taken into the like public regulation space. Patty knows about that. Um, uh, a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, for sure. So Sam, I see you have your hand up. You're back now. Do you have a question? Yeah, I think mine like is a, a combo question here. Um, how did it work for you guys in your relationship with you being the like the quote unquote expert and like, let me teach you this? How did that, how did that dynamic go? I would, I'll let Rob answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything, Rob. <laughs> oh, um, we can't hear you. You're muted. He's probably muted we, on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we have time to prepare. <laughs> uh, no, I think there's a little bit of just understanding that you got to stay in your own lane. You know, I'm really good at what I do and she's really good at what she does. So combining that was just, you got to give a little blind <laughs> trust to it and uh, yeah, be able to really comprehend and understand what the goal is. Uh, and that's what we came together was finding the common goal of streamlining the, the whole process and, and making it uh, smoother, more profitable and less stressful. Um, you know, and now this, these, these, these little things that, uh, that Stephanie's gone through, um, over the course of this little presentation. I mean, a lot of that is just kind of ingrained in me now. I mean, I'm literally sitting here working on organizing uh, cabinets for the new uh, the new shop and 
organizing what cabinet goes where to be mo most efficient. So, I mean, it's little things like that kind of get into you and stay. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think there's a little bit of just blind trust there. Yeah, and I think the the stay in your lane thing is kind of what we practice as consultants um, with or, or lean mm -hmm. practitioners or whatever you'd call it um, with any business we go into. We don't we don't imply that we know their business better than than they do. We offer tools and options, and mm -hmm. we see where there's resistance and we see where there's acceptance. And so where we see acceptance, that's where we push a little bit more. And where we see resistance, we wait and see if it starts to be less resistance and we don't push it until that starts to give. And so it's kind of, I would say it's no different in the relationship. If there's resistance, I'm going to shift with him and see where he's more inclined to, to pull, you know, we want to have the pull. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you don't, you don't change that if you're in a, even more if you're in a relationship with someone. Penny is laughing. She's cracking me up. Lean, lean in marriage. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that at the one interchange. I think maybe it was the was this one or the one where I talked about my son? That's must right. have been the one before because I don't I don't remember that conversation. Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. But I do like um, I know it was actually somebody at the standard that showed me that bullseye model for coaching where you want to get like in the relationship, you know the what, whether it's a professional relationship or personal relationship that you're trying to like stay in that learning zone where you're not pushing somebody so far over the edge that they're like, get away from me, but you're pushing them enough to explore uh, some kind of growth or learning that is happening. Right. And we are mad learners. Like we are, I think all of us are learning so much all the time i found out that like doing a time study of his nostril piercings um they were like 30 seconds for the piercing and the jewelry insertion like it was so super fast so then when so then when the clients would come in like really nervous about their their nostril piercing i'm like dude it's over in 30 seconds <laughs> i know for a fact <laughs> I've, I've i've timed it i have the data <laughs> <laughs> the data the to it. i love it <laughs> anyway sorry I, well um i think Let's take, let's see if there, we have one more question and then I want to um, leave some space for our usual networking activities. And I have a surprise, a surprise networking tool for us to use today. And the, the other thing I was just going to say is that um, Rob and I gave the similar presentation to this. It was much way longer. I don't know what the heck we talked about the whole time, um, but to about 200 body piercers at the Association of Professional Piercing. Um, and so, so yeah, I've, I've worked a little tiny bit with a couple other piercers, but it had a lot of people like thinking a little differently about how they do their work. So that was, that was kind of fun. Anyway. So um, if I decide to go and get a body piercing one day, I should be like looking for that seal association of, of professional piercers, professional piercers. And then I'll just start dropping names. Like I know Stephanie Hill and Rob Hill. Oh yeah. You might've seen the presentation at your conference. <laughs> yeah. I'm a volunteer every year and he's a speaker. So they would know. Love it. Love it. 